spaces, and thank you for coming to uh, Panama Baptist Church, where we worship the Lord Jesus Christ together. Just want to, uh, a couple things I want to call your attention to right away. I just had an announcement given to me by Maddie that she would like all the AMP students from third grade to fifth grade to quick go downstairs for a picture because uh, they want to send that to Joan Hunick, correct? It's her birthday. It was her birthday. Today. Today's her birthday. So they want to send that to her. So if you're in third to fifth grade, uh, Maddie's right there. She's going to lead you downstairs, right, Maddie? You better get started. Get down out of the booth. Start walking that way. And go down, follow her real quick, and you'll be back before you know. Okay? But don't escape. Don't leave the building. All right? You don't want to leave. There she is. She's standing in the back of the room. You can come back. A couple other announcements I want to share with you. Uh, immediately after the service, we're going to be heading out to the Cornish uh, campground. The, the uh, people in my small group revive the students and the parents of revive they're invited to go out to cornish campground which is in bear lake just head south and you'll eventually run into it and if you don't know where it's at you need to talk to to, to tim or or deanna is her name or myself and we will get you there so that's immediately following the service thursday is a, uh, an opportunity for you to be involved in our back to school bash. We had that last year, it was the first time that we hosted that, and we helped the community prepare their students to go back to school. So we supply them with like backpacks and, and school supplies, pencils and things like that that they need, and we're able to build bridges into our community like that. And so if you are interested, even in a, even a small way, we'd ask you to come out to the meeting on Thursday at 7 o'clock down in Fellowship Hall. And so that is uh, for the Back to School Batch. Next Sunday, the cooks will be here, Andy and Mara, and they will be taking over the Sunday school from uh, AMP all the way up uh, through our adult Sunday school. And that will be down in Fellowship Hall. Then after that, they will be here in the auditorium, and Andy will be uh, sharing with us a, a message from God's Word. So if you're able to come out and to listen to that, and if you're able to stay, uh, there will be a dinner afterwards in their honor. It's a cookout style. Uh, we're not going to eat outside, but it's going to be like the picnic type food, and it's going to be down in the fellowship hall. If you're interested in that, there's a sign up in the, on the back table if you're able to come, and then if you're able to bring something. So we'd appreciate you signing up for that. Uh, next is our Trash to Treasure that we had last Monday. Remember that? Where it was all, that Fellowship Hall was filled with a bunch of stuff. We brought in $390.74. And that money will be given to cooks uh, when they, well, presented to them. It gets mailed, I think, to their mission agency. But they will be presented with that money next week and that will help them towards projects there on the field in Portugal. So thank you for cooperating in that way. Uh, two more things. Uh, double your dollars. If you notice, that I did a lot of coloring this week on that thermometer. Uh, there was over $15,000 given last Sunday. And you know, over, yeah, well, I think we need to applaud. <laughs> Been, it's been over a year, I believe, we've been asking for people to contribute towards the roofing fund, and someone stepped out a couple months ago and even put the challenge out to people that they would match dollar for dollar the money that was given up to $10,000 in, uh, in the honor of Terry King. And so they, that, you rose to that occasion, and there was extra money that was even given last week, where, which caused that $10,000 matching fund to kick in. So we're, we're less than $5,000 away from meeting our roofing goal. So if you can give to that, get us to that top, and you say, well, I thought it was a $50,000 goal. Well, remember I mentioned about a month or so ago that we had to move it up to 55, because what we did, the trustees, is they, uh, there was a couple recommendations by the roofer that we, we uh, were talking to them about, which are called add-ons. If you ever did construction projects, and so we, we said, yeah, we think we need to be doing those add-ons, which would include some gutter work, 
and also the removal of the chimney that's out here on the north side of the building. And uh, if you don't know what that is, it's it's a big cement thing that, that goes up in the air. It's up higher in the building. It's gonna, they're going to remove that and also bring the siding, uh, fill that in with siding. So that that was an add-on. We thought this is the time to be doing those add-ons when we peeled the roof off. So that brought us up to uh, 50, close to fifty-five thousand dollars, and we're almost there. So keep on giving, and we'll meet that goal very shortly. One last thing: many of you already know that uh, that Don Williams' father was going through a very dark time in his life, and kind of on the edge uh, with with life and death. And, and God was merciful, and this week uh, took him home uh, to be with him. This week on Thursday, I believe it was right Thursday. And so uh, Dawn and her mom and the, her sisters are uh, just, uh, it's, a, it's a grieving process. You know what I'm talking about. It was a relief in one way, but also there's mourning. So it's a kind of a dual thing that they're going through right now. Uh, today there is the visitation at Peterson Funeral Home, correct? Correct me if I'm wrong, between 2 and 5. And then tomorrow is the funeral at Wilty Community Church in Russell, 1 o'clock. Right? Oh, got that right. That was off the top of my head. So, uh, if you can participate uh, and come out to that, that would be great. If not, just, you know, even letters and cards, I'm sure that Don and the family would appreciate that. So, uh, we'll, but as we begin our service this morning, let's start with prayer and then be reminded of the Williams family as well. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather here this morning as uh, people that uh, place you first in their life. And, and God, I, I thank you for them. Thank you for causing them to choose to come to this body of believers this morning. And I pray that as we share together life over the next, even the next hour, as we corporately come together for the express purpose of worshiping you, God, help us to be so focused. Help us to put aside our preferences and the, and the things that are going on in our life and, and really clear out our minds and focus upon worshiping you. Because we know, we know clearly that you are God and you so deserve all of our worship. Help us to focus on that today and may you be glorified in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. What we're reminded of this week is that no matter what, God is in control. And we have to put all our faith and trust in Him and know that no matter what, it is well with our soul and it is well with whatever God decides. He's, he comes first. You know, and now it's our turn and our job to praise His great name because He is worthy of all our praise. Stand with us this morning as we begin our song. Do it again. See you. 
so much for all that you've done for us because, Father, we know if it wasn't for you, we would not be here today being able to sing those praises. You truly are a great God, Father, and we thank you. And may each and every day our praises sing of how great you are and that it is well with our soul. Praise the name of Jesus. We thank you. We love you. In your name, amen.
we raised fifty-five thousand, almost fifty-five thousand dollars to put a roof over our heads to keep praising God here. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. We're gonna sing through this two more times. Sing it out. Sing with me. How great is our God? How great. A little bit slow here there there it is very good all right sometimes electronics is a little bit slow um if you were to ask a child or a teenager what their definition of a good dad or mom is you would probably get kind of a wide variety of answers but no doubt somewhere in the midst of that would be the definition of how that mom or dad gives them what they want, right? No doubt that's got to be in there some way. Because after all, your teenager knows what's best for them, right? Have you ever known a teenager that doesn't know what's best for them? <laughs> but yet when we think about that question, we turn it a little bit, and when we ask the rest of us, how we would define a good God. How would you define it? And you might be surprised that the way you answer that is not much different than the way your teenager would have answered. Right? A good God will give me what I want. A good God will take away the pain and the suffering of my life and really give me a bowl of cherries every day. Proverbially. That's a good God, after all, because I know what's best for my life. Doesn't it sound like the teenager? I know what's best, and God, you'll do it for me, right? Otherwise, you're not a good God. 
and that pain and suffering you allow in my life, you bring that in, and that would go away because that's good things. Those are the good things that I want in my life. And we really think that we know what's best. But when we think about God, our God, the God we worship, Creator, Almighty, Jehovah, Yahweh God, when we think about Him, He is good. He is defined as good. God is good. But it doesn't stop there. He is, he is also a lot of other things, such as just and righteous. And those two terms are synonymous as we talk about God. And one it really intertwines around the other, and we find a perfect God, unadulterated God, in all of his justice, in all of his righteousness. And we know that to be true. We know that. Even though that really we want the good things of life. But we know who God is. When we think about our life, and we, when we think about human life, we see that there is a time in which God very carefully, precisely, interacts within our lives in a way that it doesn't seem like it's good or just or righteous. But yet he is. And there is a certain time within humanity, whether it be on an individual basis or a national basis, that God draws a line in the sand and says, enough. No longer will you walk in that way. No longer will this earth tolerate you or what you are doing, or what this nation is doing, and that's enough. And we can look at several biblical examples of that, and let me just kind of freshen your memory a little bit. And I think the very first one that comes to my mind is Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, it's enough of going your wicked ways, your ungodly ways. I think of King Agrippa. And he was the one, if you know anything about history, in, in biblical history, that here's a guy that was so full of himself, so prideful at the way that he ruled and reigned, that he would dress a certain way that sun would reflect off of his garments, and people would look at him and, and see the things that he did, and would proclaim that he is God. God dealt with King Agrippa. I think of... Uh, king Zedekiah, for example, another king in which is very much like the guy that we have been talking about, King Ahab, which we will continue to talk about today. But King Zedekiah was another way. And not only did he rule in a wicked and evil way, but he also led the priest and elders and the nation to go the same direction. And when we get into this passage that I posted up here in front of you, 2 Chronicles 36, when you come to those very last verses, 15 and 16, you will see where God, over a period of time, sent messengers to Zedekiah, to the nation of Israel, in which to stop, stop going in that direction. And he sent messenger after messenger, and he didn't listen to them. Look at what it says in this passage. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. God says, enough. No more. God works in those ways. We will see that first-hand account with King Ahab and also his wonderful wife named Jezebel. <laughs> Sarcastically, you know. If you would be so kind to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 21. It's another long passage. It's a long narrative. 
And I could give you little bits and pieces and tell you what it's talking about, but I think the best way to handle a biblical Old Testament narrative in particular is to read the narrative because it is precisely the words of God that he wants to hand it down to generation after generation. So we're, I'm going to read this to you, and you're going to, hear, you're going to hear a little bit about the life of King Ahab and Jezebel and the wickedness that they continued to pursue until God said, Enough! Listen to what they did. Verse 1 in chapter 21. Now Naboth, the Jesuelite, had a vineyard in Jezreel, beside the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And after, <coughs> excuse me, and after this, Ahab said to Naboth, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it is near my house, and I will give you a better vineyard for it, or if it seems good to you, I will give you its value in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I give you the inheritance of my father. And Ahab went into his house vexed and sullen because of what Naboth the Jezreelite had said to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father's. And he lay down in his bed and turned away his face It would eat no food. Verse 5, But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so vexed that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jesuelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please you, I, I will give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. And Jezebel, his wife, said to him, Do you not? Govern Israel? Arise and eat bread and let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jesuite. Verse 8. And so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed it with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. And she wrote in the letters, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and set two worthless men opposite him, and let them bring a charge against him, saying, You have cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of, this city, and the men of his city, the elders and the leaders who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent word to them. And it was written in the letters that she had sent to them, they proclaimed a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people. And the two worthless men came in and sat opposite him. And the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. And they took him outside the city and stoned him to death with stones. And they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned. He is dead. And as soon as Jezebel heard that Naboth has been stoned and was dead, dead Jezebel sent, said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jesuelite, for he, re he has refused to give you the money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. And as soon as Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab rose to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jesuelite, to take possession of it. So here we read this passage and we look at it and we say, oh my goodness, how could anyone kill such a person in such a way in order for a little piece of land? Is that even possible? And we're rather appalled at that. But what we are seeing, folks, is a heart that is bent on serving itself, that allows itself to manifest its wickedness in order to feed upon that object of whatever that heart wants. Ahab, as we know from previous study, that he himself knew clearly that Yahweh is God. There is no other God. Any other God that was in Israel was all man-made. They were all fabricated out of some human's mind. And clearly, Ahab saw that, and he knew it. 
intangibly, he saw fire come down from heaven and consume an offering and making it all disappear, just instantly gone. He controlled the weather for three and a half years. Not one drop of moisture landed upon the ground for three and a half years until God says, I'm sending rain this day. And it rained. So clearly, Ahab knew that Yahweh is the only, only God. He knew that. But yet, out of that heart, he still chose that heart over Yahweh. And he pursued his heart and wherever it would take him. We think idolatry. How can that possibly be? But Dr. Einrich said it this way. Idolatry happens when we invest something, anything, which the power to bring us peace and joy. Give us, let me read that whole thing over again, because I put the emphasis in the wrong direction. Idolatry happens when we invest something, anything, which has the power to bring us peace and joy, to give us what we should seek only from God. That's idolatry. Whether we are talking about some king from centuries ago that was invested himself in idolatry with the idols, a little Buddha look and idolatry idol things that we normally attach it to, or we are thinking about 21st century idolatry. And by the way, that is alive and well today, okay? Especially, especially in America. And we can, we can talk about a lot of different vices that we have that are attached to idolatry today. But here is what is happening with Ahab. He chose something over Yahweh and pursued that to its fullest extent. And did you see the manipulation that he allowed to happen? Did you see what, what happened when Naboth says, No, I won't sell you that piece of property. I, I, don't, I don't want your money. I don't want another piece of property. This is the inheritance that, that I was given God has allowed me to have, and I'm, I'm going to hold on to it. And there's nothing wrong with that. He did what was right. It, that was good. But then Ahab, he is just like that child in your house that wants their own way. He throws a temper tantrum. Isn't it amazing? I, 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 was, I, I was glad that nobody heard me laugh in my office when I'm reading this and I'm studying this. Out. Here's a spoiled brat, a king at that. And he runs into his palace, jumps on his bed, and he looks at him and just stares at the wall. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to talk. He was vexed and sullen is what Scripture says. And you say, well, what is that? Vexed is he was annoyed and frustrated. Sullen. It was depressed. Isn't that amazing the way we allow ourselves to behave? And when you talk to biblical counselors, they will tell you that more times than not, the reason that, the, that, that all of these, many of these things that are brought on that manifest itself in our life comes out of a prideful heart. Here was a man that wanted his own way. And he allowed these things to erupt out of his life. He was annoyed, he was frustrated, he was depressed. He didn't want that. And he was responding in this way. And I, here I am you know, thinking about this guy and then I started thinking about my own life. That's when it doesn't get funny anymore. That's when it gets serious. And I look at myself in the proverbial mirror, and I say, what? You know what, Rodney? That's got you written all over it. And I'm a pastor. So this is Ahab. <clears throat> Let's not talk about me. Jezebel. What was happening with Jezebel here? Usurping authority that was not hers. And she underhandedly developed this plot to kill Naboth. Why? There was something going on within her life. There was a stirring, a, a, a heart that is clearly away from Yahweh that pursued something far different, her pagan's heart desire that moved in a further direction, and she pulled in other people to develop that? How wicked can one be? 
She incorporated elders and leaders, and not only that, she employed some worthless scoundrel witnesses to help get what she wanted. That's corruption. That's wickedness. And God is going to say, this is enough. That's enough out of you two. No more will this earth hold your wickedness. I'm stepping in. These two people had what we call the debased mind. The deba debased mind. You say, what is a debased mind? It is one of a very low moral standards. Not anything new. And as a matter of fact, in our current society, we can look around and we can say, you know what? We're becoming more and more of a debased society, and you would be absolutely correct. A debased mind happens the further we get away from God and the development of our self-centered, prideful heart. It goes in that direction. And that's exactly where Ahab and Jezebel were at, and they were leading the nation around them. The debased mind, well, what, how's, that, how's that come out? Well, Jezebel, in her debased mind, succeeded with fulfilling her pagan's heart desire that was bent on authority and power and greed. That's where it was leading her. It kept taking her in that direction. Did you notice what was said in this passage? Look at this. Notice her satisfaction. Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. I did it. I knew I could do it. Hey, Ed, you just give me the power. You give me your signet ring, and I'll get it done. You men, you don't know how to get things done. You weak king, you don't know what you're doing. Give me that signet ring, and I'm going to get the job done. Just imagine the way she stands back and just puts her chin up in the air and says, I did it. I did it. Fulfilling and feeding her prideful heart. What about Ahab? Ahab himself, he succeeded with fulfilling his idolatrous heart's desire bent on anything. Whatever it is, on his, his feelings, what he wanted, his self-centeredness, whatever, whatever it, was, it was demanding, he wanted to pursue after that. And he succeeded in doing that just over a little piece of land. But interesting enough about the idolatrous heart, the, this prideful, self-fulfilling heart, is it, it's a hunger that never is satisfied. He gets that piece of land. You think he's going to be good with that? You think he's going to be satisfied? No. The answer is no. He continues to grow and grow and grow. And this is where these two fine people are at. And I'm saying that sarcastically. Ahab never questioned what happened to Naboth. He could care less about other people. There was only one person that King Ahab was looking out for. Number one. I don't care about anyone else. I don't care about their life. I don't care if he, if he suffered through that stoning. I don't care. what I want what I want, and I'll get it regardless who I step on, what I have to do to get it. He never questioned about Naboth's death, and that wickedness was allowed to reign in these two people's lives, which allowed Ahab the promise of his self-centered self -centered heart's desire. You see, that's the way it goes. When we allow ourselves to depart from the truth of God, from pursuing God, putting Him first in our lives and chasing hard after Him, denying ourselves and pursuing Him, we start turning the tide. We start turning our life and we start chasing after the things that my heart wants, what your heart wants. And we allow ourselves to become in things, involved with things that really aren't right, that are perhaps immoral, that are wrong. And we, we chase after those things. Maybe it's something within our world. Maybe it's a promotion at work. You step on somebody at work, proverbially, and you get to get what you want. Or maybe you cut somebody off in traffic. 
I'll throw you. You run in it. You know, we do things even in very small, subtle ways to get what we want. To do things that you know that aren't right. Maybe, if, maybe it might be colored, just shade it a little bit. But we do those things. Why do we do those things? Because it feeds our self-centeredness. It's a wickedness that brews inside of our hearts. Our hearts are dirty and wicked because it's tainted with sin. It needs to be corrected. And we correct it through knowing the truth and pursuing the truth. Yielding to the Holy Spirit in our life. But Ahab, out of his debased mind, we see all of these things. And God says, it's over. It's done. You'll go no further. The debased mind. What happens? How does God end this? We'll finish out the passage here. And let me just read these next few verses. Verse 17. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick your own blood. Ahab, then he goes to Ahab, or Elijah goes to Ahab, and he says to him, Have you found me? Ahab says, Have you found me, O my enemy? He said, I have found you because you have sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and cut off from Ahab every male bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like this, the house of Basha, the son of ah Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me, and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs shall eat. And anyone, who, and anyone of his who dies in the open country, the birds of heaven shall eat. And there was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited or stirred up. He acted very abominab abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. It's pretty sad stuff. It's pretty, not pretty sad, it's very sad. He was sold out, as scripture says, to do evil. Sold out. Committed fully. We always talk about our society in which we live, and commitment is one of those things that is really kind of elusive. What is commitment? Here's someone that is committed, fully committed, sold out to doing evil. But God was going to bring Elijah back on the scene. Did you notice this whole passage, that first passage that I read to you? Elijah not even in the is not even anywhere near what's going on. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the, re the record, the narrative was focused upon Ahab and Jezebel to describe to us the wickedness, the, the, the heart that is bent on doing whatever it wants to do. And now God was going to bring Elijah back onto the scene. Remember where we left Elijah last week? It wasn't very pretty where Elijah was at. He was dealing with some very dark things in his heart, some very harmful issues. But God healed him over the period of a number of months. God put the legs underneath him once again, strengthened him. Now he was going to bring him back to Ahab and Jezebel. Remember, Jezebel was wanting to kill Elijah. That put the fear in Elijah. Now he was going to go back and face them nose to nose and tell them what God said. 
That took courage. That took a lot of courage. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure how many of us would be really anxious to do that. But somehow, some way, Elijah did. That's amazing. That's very amazing. And when we see what's happening here in, in the life of Ahab and Jezebel, it's even more incredible that he would stand in the face of that evil people. Ahab was sold out to wickedness in every area of his life, along with his wife. And together they formed an unparalleled partnership of evil. But God drew that line. And the question of that day would be the same question as we hear today. Who has the right? Who has the authority to do, to, to say what's right and wrong? What's moral, what's immoral? I'm the king. I can say what goes on, right? I'm the president. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a senator. I'm a, I'm a representative. I, I, can, I can say, I can determine what's right or wrong for the United States of America. I'm a Supreme Court justice. I can determine what's right and what's wrong. What's moral, what's immoral. Abortion, non-abortion. All of those things, just like the nation of Israel was facing. With a couple that really thought, because that they were king, I have the right to say what's moral and what's immoral for this country. Can I just say, as we will see, as we have already read, that God draws a line. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you are king of Israel. I don't care if you are the president of the United States, the greatest nation on the earth. I don't care. You cross the line against all morality, against right and wrong, and I will have it no more. And we can look back through history, and we can see where God, much stronger nations than this country, where God says, enough, you're done. We can talk about Nero. We can talk about Adolf Hitler. Sure, it cost millions and millions of lives. God's patience allowed that to run its course when it was done. And God drew on the line and said, no more. And not only does it happen on a national scale, it happens to individuals. And I suspect in my own life that I have seen where God has done that. You're not going any further. You've ran as far away from me as possible. You've, allowed to chase, you've been allowed to chase after your heart long enough. You're done. I draw the line. You will go no further. Now when we think about this, when we think about what's happened here, we can clearly see that God draws a line for every nation, and he draws a line for people, in the rebellion, in their debased mind that they allow to continue to go further and further. And God says, enough. I want to read to you a passage that's just as fresh as the day that it was written. And really, it's for all humanity. Whether it's back with Cain and Abel, whether it's with Ahab and Jezebel, whether it's with this first century audience that it was written to, or whether it's the 21st century church. This letter is written for us to understand what happens when a person walks away from God, goes further and further and further and further and we can throw our fits, and we can throw our tantrums, and we can say, and we can say such things as, I don't believe that there is a God. You've heard that. I, I don't believe that. And I don't want to follow God that he has allowed all this corruption and allow all this hatred to go on. If, if God's really there, then why? He can't be very good God. We hear all of that. And God allows that to happen, allows people to chase after their debased minds so that what makes this text even as relevant, and we say scripture's not relevant, I, I bid you never to say that. Listen to what it says here in verse 28. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. 
And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They, were, they are filled, excuse me, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them but give approval to do those who practice them. It's sad. It's sad to see the hearts of people continuing to go away from God. And we look at that and say, well, you know, yeah, I just think that's terrible. I think it's bad. And I'm totally against these people and, and taking Ten Commandments out of school and the prayer out of school. And I'm just totally against it. Stop. Look in the mirror. Take a good hard look at what you're talking. Who's talking? And the way that we, ourselves, 21st century, New Testament church, Bible-believing church, have we pursued these types of things in our own hearts where we have not really been pursuing after God? I dare say that none of us have pursued Him the way that we should be pursuing Him. And we only have to look at our own life and look at the things that we do throughout the course of the week. Look at what we do in one day's time. What do we pursue after? It's a very slippery slope. We may not have a, a debased mind as far as some, but surely it's further than what it ever should be. You never know, folks, when the patience of God is going to run out, not just nationally, we like to talk about that with our government, but with ourselves individually. When God says, you know, it's enough. It's enough. And maybe you're here today and you have never, 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 ever placed your faith in Christ. You've never been on that path to, to follow Him, to repent of your sin, to, present, to, to repent of the road that you're on, to turn, to stop and turn. Today, you need to do that. Repent and turn from your sin, your waywardness, your rebellious life, and turn to Jesus and live. If you're here today and you've never done that, please talk to us. Talk to us. I'm, I'm around here. I, I live here. <laughs> I'm here today. I'm here throughout the week. All it takes is just one quick call or something. Just get old and say, can I please talk to you? And believe me, the schedule gets cleared out. And I will set up a time, and, and, and myself, Pastor Ryan, would love to talk to you. If you say, well, I really don't want to talk to the guy, our wives, they'll, they'll love to talk to you. We could sit down with you, and we could, we could show you from Scripture where you can place your faith in Christ and set your feet on the path of true life. Don't let another day goes by, go by. Repent and turn to Jesus and live. Why don't we stand and I'll close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to study, to read, to understand, to comprehend, and most of all to, imply, to, to apply it to our lives. God, thank you for that. Don't allow these words to easily escape our minds. Cause them to continue to hammer with inside of us, knowing that the life that we lead must be on the right path, must be in the right pursuit. God, help us not to allow ourselves to feed our self-centeredness, our pride. We know the way that it goes. We know the things that it demands out of us. God, help us to turn away from that and continue to pursue after you. Oh, Father, I pray this 
In the great name of Jesus, amen. You're dismissed.